Okay, I, I, I think it's um, a good time to begin. Um, uh, welcome to the Southeast Asia Seminars, where this is another one of our uh, uh, seminars online. The, uh, our guest uh, today is Dr. Ikra Anugra, who's a research fellow at the Institute, International Institute for Asian Studies at Lighting University and a research associate at the Institute for Social and Economic Research, Education, and Information, LP3ES in Jakarta. His current project formulates political theory of conservatism in modern Indonesia, 1945 to 2020, and his works on Indonesian development and politics have been published in uh, PS Political Science and Politics, Cornell University Press, and Kyoto Review of Southeast Asia. Um, in, uh, before I invite uh, Dr. Nguyen to speak, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the, um, the uh, Q&A uh, box, and I will relate these at the end of the session to the um, to our guests. Okay, thank you. Um, would you uh, um, uh, please please begin? Thank you very much for for being part of this. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Charney, um, for the generous introduction. And I should also say thank you to uh, Michael Bueller, um, another good colleague of mine, for connecting me with the SOAS network and encouraging me to share my latest project. And before I begin, I hope you can hear me all right. <laughs> Again, I'm Ikra Nugra. A research fellow uh, at the IIS at Leiden University and also a research associate at the Institute for Economic and Social Research, Education and Information or LP3ES in Jakarta. Mm. I'm a political scientist turned political theorist and my talk today really is a testing ground for my new project on multi-strand conservatism in Indonesia. Um, basically comparing anti-communist intellectuals, uh, pro-market economists, and Islamist populists, um, looking at the underlying logic, connecting these different strands and their connections or disconnections with Western conservative thoughts and politics. It's a new project, therefore your comments and suggestions would be very appreciated. Um, let me start by mentioning some parameters of my talk or my discussion today. Here, I'm trying to do political theory or rather than intellectual history. And what I mean by that is that while I'm aware of the importance of tracing um, the influence and genealogy of ideas, which is the focus of intellectual historians, um, for my project, I'm more interested in identifying what I call as strange parallels and divergences between Western and vernacular conservatism. <clears throat> specify the novelty of um, this vernacular or peripheral conservatism, including the problematics it advances and its transmutations, and see how this vernacular variant of conservatism can help us to better understand the anatomy and characteristics of conservatism as a modern reactionary ideology or sensibility, and therefore try to ask better more innovative questions about it based on um, these uh, reflections. Um, moreover, while I truly recognize the need to study the subalterns uh, or history from below, my account really focuses on history from above. After all, as the Marxist historian Perry Anderson once said, and I quote here, quote, a history from above, a history of the intricate machinery of class domination is no less essential than a history from below. Indeed, without it, the latter in the end becomes one-sided, full stop, end quote. Therefore, here I study the antagonists, the enemies, so to speak, uh, authoritarian state elites who are basically, to use a somewhat politically incorrect language here, that native or pribumi males. And my working definition of conservatism borrows from um, the definition used by the political theorist, Corey Robin, um, who defines conservatism, broadly speaking, as an elitist, pragmatic, yet cross-class idea slash movement in defense of tradition, order, and gradual progress. <clears throat> my purpose here is to, pro to provide an account of modern conservatism, making sense of conservatism in and through uh, Indonesia. 
Uh, with that, let's begin our discussion. Paris, July 14, 1789. The city was burning. The Bastille, a fortress and a state prison, was stormed by the revolutionaries of France. The prison, the prison was a notorious symbol of the monarchical abuse of power. The ancient regime, unable to tackle the severe inequality and unable to address the people's grievances, witness its twilight. Its days were numbered. This symbolic event ushered a new era where the ideals of democracy, liberty, equal citizenship and fraternity spread like a wildfire. It was also a bloody event with the revolutionaries demanding the abolition of corrupt feudal order uh, and monarchy through insurrections, ending with the beheading of King Louis the 16th, later known as citizen Louis Capet in 1793, followed by the reign of terror. <clears throat> While Europe was watching the revolution with enthusiasm, an Anglo-Irish statesman was watching in horror. Edmund Burke, a political thinker and, and a member of parliament, and his reaction to the unfolding of the French Revolution. He was not a hardcore traditionalist. After all, he was a Whig, a believer in humanity's march to progress. But he was horrified by the idealism or rather dogmatic convictions in his view of the revolutionaries. <clears throat> in his famous treatise, Reflections on the Revolution in France, he said, I shall suspend my congratulations on the new liberty of France until I was informed how it had been combined with government, revenue, morality and religion, property, peace, and order. The English conservative philosopher, Roger Scruton, said that Burke, while recognizing the importance of political freedom, insisted that religion, family, tradition are a distillation of collective wisdom and practical rather than abstract reason. Scruton adds that according to Burke, these things connect us with the dead and the unborn, the past and the future. And these things make society, society instead of a mere collection of individuals. As Burke said, people will not look People will not look forward to posterity when they look backward to their ancestors. The French revolutionaries, in the view of Burke, in the name of, in the name of liberty, aim to tear down everything. And in doing so, they duped the masses. And in their attempt to build a new world upside down, they ended up building a despotism. The distrust of the masses is also inherent in Burke's thought. He claimed when the multitude are not under the discipline of the wiser, the expert, and the more opulent, they can scarcely be said to be in civil society. Later, Burke was christened as the founding father of Anglo-American conservatism. Fast forward two centuries later to revolutionary Indonesia. The masses and the rising educated bourgeois class kick out the Dutch colonizers. Indonesia, Indonesia joined other nations in celebrating and defending their independence through diplomacy and vicious battles. However, what constituted freedom was interpreted differently by these different social forces. The working masses demanded more. Independence revolution was a hollow concept without the democratization of class relations, without popular control of, of the mighty capital and without popular participation in state institutions. The communists, hardened by multiple struggles and had a long history as patriots, supported uh, the aspiration of the masses. So did the left-wing nationalist Sukarno, Indonesia's founding father. Under his guided democracy, essentially a form of left-wing Bonapartism, Sukarno attempted to form a united front with the masses and the communists or the PKI. This alienated other political forces and personalities, many of whom had middle-class bourgeois or even aristocratic backgrounds who thought 
that the national revolution had gone too far. It was in this context that Ali Murtopo emerged into the scene and later became one of the most dominant players in the Indonesian political stage. Historian Sonny Carson notes that Ali Murtopo was born in a relatively middle-class family on September 23rd, 1924. His family experienced economic hardship. He did not complete his education at the Dutch language middle school or MULO, and later opted to join his MULO, a Muslim militia or paramilitary organization at the age of 15. Later on, he joined the military and eventually achieved the rank of Lieutenant General. Carsonal rightly notes that, quote, though the first cards that life provided him were not very promising, he played them so well that in three decades, he not only achieved success in the military, but become one of the leading modernizers of his country. During his days of glory, his iconic portraits could be easily found and identified, including his trademark photograph of him in black glasses, giving him a sinister quality of third world dictators. <clears throat> For many, the fear of revolutionary communist takeover of power was real. Yusuf Wanandi, an anti-communist Chinese Catholic activist and Ali Murtopo's close collaborator remarked in his memoir, Shades of Grey. He said, Sukarno used mass movements and mass mobilization as his strategy not institution building. He overturned the relatively liberal democracy of the 1950s. And then he squandered the country's economic wealth. Therefore, he lost the support of the middle class, including Wanandi. And in the view of Yusuf Wanandi at that time, as an anti-communist activist, he thought Indonesia would most probably become a communist-run country. And we, as Catholics, knew that we would be the first up against the wall. The history of Western and Indonesian conservatism might be separated by vast geographical, cultural, and historical differences, <clears throat> but both share the same features as world historical events with important consequences. Both share the features of conservatism of fear, fear of the, de of the, demo of the democratic demands for redistribution, class struggle and control of the state by so-called easily manipulated working masses. David Borchier in his marvelous book, Illiberal Democracy in Indonesia, identifies the possible influence of Catholic social teaching on Murtopo's thinking due to his friendship uh, with Yusuf Anandi and other uh, Catholic intellectuals. especially on Murtopo's thinking on the role of peasants and workers in development. But what is also interesting in my view is the parallels and divergences between Ali Murtopo's thoughts and Anglo-American conservatism. This is the focus of my inquiry. <clears throat> after, the, after the destruction of the Communist Party or the PKI, and its sympathizers and the ouster of Sukarno, the anti-communist bourgeois coalition managed to install their own version of democratic governance, the developmentalist new order regime. With the coalition's political credentials and Suharto at the helm of the state, Murtopa and his boys had a free reign to realize their visions. Murtopa became a close aide of Suharto, co-founded the Center for Strategic and International Studies or CSIS, as it's famously known as the regime's unofficial think tank. It made feasible political moves and not so feasible or hidden special intelligence operations. Ali Murtopo, with the help of his intellectual collaborators at CSIS, most notably Yusuf Wanandi and Harichan Silalahi, published numerous writings. The amount or number of publications of Murtopo's extensive writings might match that of Vladimir Lenin's selected works. Here are some key texts of Ali Murtopo. 
some basic thoughts on the acceleration and modernization of 25 years development, national political strategies, cultural strategies, workers and peasants in development. And he also published numerous essays, gave tons of speeches and wrote short books. It is a common secret that these texts were most likely ghost written by his CSIS friends. But I contend, and this is also something that the CSIS intellectuals themselves uh, argued, that these texts are the actual distillation of Murtopo's highly original thinking, whom he found it difficult to write in texts. So what are Murtopo's core ideas? His core ideas cover a wide range of topics, ranging from historiography to political strategies. And I will try to basically summarize um, his thinking. He argued that national revolution is a prerequisite for bourgeois development. Sukarno's flirtation with populism was an aberration and betrayal of the original spirit of the independence movement or the national revolution. Free individuals are always connected to the social. These individuals are always part of historical organic societal whole. Murtopo also promoted pragmatic capitalist development and he oscillated between, between state greater state control and greater deregulation or liberalization of the economy. He championed what he called as accelerated modernization, which he described as rational and programmatic economic, technological and social transformation, as opposed to overzealous revolutionary enthusiasm. He also discussed about culture and education he aimed to promote modern or non-primordial corporate citizenship. He saw education as a venue for cultivation of values conducive for economic development goals. And he attempted to promote a new national culture amidst the dying traditional culture. His political philosophy or strategy is notorious. He promoted what he called as democracy, which essentially took the form of electoral trusteeship and depoliticizing the citizenry, the citizenry by promoting the floating mass policy, which basically not allowing the masses to mobilize outside elections. He recognized different diverse social and political cleavages in Indonesia, with the exception of the left. He promoted anti-extremism, which basically meant anti-communism and anti-Islamism. Controversially, he promoted the extensive political involvement of the armed forces in politics. And lastly, and obviously he was obsessed with political stability. As a corpus of conservative thoughts, Murtopo's ideas might sound reasonably modern in a repressive way for sure, and transformative in a sense that it completely overhauls the vision of Sukarno and PKI. It completely overhauls the socialisms of Sukarno and PKI into a more social form of market economy and electoral competition. So what is exactly conservative about this? This might look confusing, but remember that conservatism is not anti-change. Change is necessary in conservatism to defend privileges and to defend what Corey Robin said as the felt experience of power. After all, as Edmund Burke himself said, state without the means of some change is without the means of its own conservation. Seeing from this perspective, we can see the connections between Burke's and Murtopo's thoughts and the consistency or the unifying logic between Murtopo's thoughts and actions. 
in political engineering Murtopo ensured the victory and hegemony of Golkar, the regime's party. He tamed oppositions and opposition parties by limiting the number of parties and forcing different parties to join with each other. He supported democracy in the name of democracy. He was, in, he was involved in the colonization of West Papua and East Timor, and he turned Islamists into useful idiots for his own agenda of ensuring political stability. He co-founded the CSIS, as I mentioned before. He published numerous writings. He was famous for his autodidact, le autodidact learning. Um, he spent his nights reading books and one of his favorite pastime is to invite people to his house uh, from morning till night. And basically he used that, those opportunities as a way to build informal group discussions with these people and interlocutors from all walks of life, ranging from intellectuals to um, fellow military uh, leaders and personnel. He was a close aide to President Suharto. He was involved in the normalization of Indonesian-Malaysia relations, and he promoted what can be considered as regional peace and stability in ASEAN, regional stability in the surface of um, economic development. He was also involved in cultural propaganda by mentoring bourgeois activists. He was a patron of the film industry, but he was also involved in censoring films. He helped establishing the regime's newspapers, Suara Karya. He provided the initial capital for the newspaper's establishment. He once served as a minister of information, a fitting role for him, I would say. And he was active giving speeches in different parts, different provinces in Indonesia. He uh, went to the provinces, met low ranking officials. Um, he met civil servants, he met teachers and gave speeches um, outlining his vision for Indonesia. Obviously, um, besides legal political activities and lobbying, his operations and activities oftentimes were supported by covert intelligence operations and intense um, political. So what is the connection between Murtopo's vision of conservatism and Burkean conservatism? I would say that Murtopo basically turbocharged Burkean conservatism. Murtopo's conservatism is Burkean conservatism on steroids. It is Burkean conservatism taken to its extreme end. Murtopo put his faith not only in tradition, as Burke did, but he also placed an emphasis on reason, which is a form of enlightened technocracy, which I will discuss later uh, 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 in later part of my um, talk. And for Murtopo, rather than gradually conceding to thrive, he conserved by shaking things up and accelerating bourgeois modernization. He shared similar strategies with his enemy, the left. One can even say that he co-opted strategies from the left. So Murtopo's conservatism is not only conservatism of fear, but it's, it is also, I would say, a conservatism of optimism. A conservatism with a dash of can-do attitude. There were enabling contexts that allow Murtopo to have this more optimistic view of conservative statecraft. It was Cold War and the domestic balance of power was in his favor. He and his intellectual friends could use American social science theories, basically modernization theories as for his intellectual justification. And Murtopo and his collaborators had available blueprints 
for statecraft, for economic development. Models such as bureaucratic polity and developmental state models in East Asian countries and, in, and to a lesser extent in Southeast Asia. Another influence uh, on Murtopo's thoughts is Cold War social science. And what I mean by Cold War social science is empiricist social science, a variant of modernization theories. And the goal of this corpus of knowledge is to defend anti-communist liberal order and the American way of life against communist encroachment. So writers such as Samuel Huntington, Daniel Bell, or Rostow, uh, the US National Security Advisor and his famous treatise, The Stages of Economic Growth, a Non-Communist Manifesto, where he outlined a stages view of capitalist development, transitioning from traditional society to transitional stage to age of mass consumption driven uh, by um, capitalist economy after a country managed to take off, managed to um, um, successfully graduate from the transitional stage. This was also the thinking behind New Order's developmental economic development model. And in a nutshell, I would say that the idea is to combine revolution from above with entrepreneurship and middle-class society or middle-class rule. And Murtopo and his cohort see this uh, as a way to discard the quote-unquote irrationality of highly emotional leftist populism and revolutionary creed of Sukarno and the PKI. In a way, the influence of Cold War social science in Indonesia under the new order mirrors the influence of, the, of libertarian or conservative economics of James Buchanan, the Nobel Prize winner and economist whose public choice theory became an intellectual foundation for the successful radical right-wing marketization agenda of social life against the gains of social movements in the United States. But phenomena showed attempts to subvert redistributive demands through democratic channels. Murdoch also had a hard time because New Order authoritarianism was anything but stable. The regime was threatened by intermittent rivalry, complaints and protests from younger student activists who then participated in riots against excessive Japanese investment um, in Indonesia, anti-Japanese riots. Murtopo also had to face Suharto's wrath against Murtopo and his gang, and the opposition and criticism from Islamic groups against, uh, against him and against, um, against his group. The New Order regime was also riff and full with latent social tensions. And this was reflected in Murtopo's occasional outbursts. Um, Murtopo was commonly known for his seemingly calm demeanor, or, or at least that is the public image that he would like to portray. But as you can see here, he also showed some occasional outbursts of anger, especially during his tenure as a Minister of Information. In one speech, he said, why is it that the Minister of Information produces lousy publications? This made me emotional sometimes. In my notes for the drafts of these publications, sometimes I write that this is crappy or this is dumbass. Eventually, the cost of modernization, conservative modernization for the regime, um, Ali Murtopo, was pretty high. The regime was founded after the politicide of the communists. Over time, the regime witnessed tensions due to rising inequality and repression. Increasing chronic capitalism, corruption, and Suharto's increasingly erratic behaviors also do not help the regime supporters. And this downfall trajectory of the regime was also mirrored in Murtopo's own trajectory. He was dismissed from Suharto's inner circle 
He had to deal with declining health conditions. He suffered multiple heart, heart attacks three times or four times, and eventually he died in 1984 at the age of 60. So what do we make of more topos conservatism? I think there are several observations and notes that uh, we can make from Murtopo's brand of conservatism. Murtopo's belief in reason, in, pro in reason and programs, I would say is a code word for a form of technocracy and non-contestational managed democracy, which combined with some form of trickle-down economics. I also see Murtopo and his allies as vanguards of the new order counter-revolution. Moreover, Murtopo often liked to portray himself as a champion of new cultural sensibilities. But the idea of tradition and organ organicism, the idea that tradition and the conception of Indonesian state and society as, as a cohesive family unit have always been there in Murtopo's um, thinking. It, re it reappeared in his thought in the name of, and, or under the guise of mon the creation or the need to create modern national culture and identity. Ultimately, his vision for older, orderly, yet accelerated modernization is an oxymoron. In a way, we can say that Murtopo's project was a fulfillment of Indonesia's long Burojo revolution, the fulfillment, the fulfillment of the kind of political order that the Indonesian elites were involved in the anti-colonial project had been dreaming for a long time, where the lower order, the masses, was um, integrated into the polity, but eventually the one in charge was the middle class uh, and the bourgeois class. And Mutopo's project was also a fulfillment of the Burkean vision of gradual quality of ordered quality and an efficient of defense of hierarchy. In the end, both Western and Indonesian conservatism share a fear of mass democratic demands, especially demands pertaining to wealth redistribution. Lastly, for today's progressives and activists, Murtopo might be a Machiavellian trickster or ruthless operator from whom we can learn from. One does not have to be a Machiavellian to acknowledge the enemy's analytical and political prowess, to acknowledge the necessity of combining sharp mind with street smart sensibility of the ability to negotiate things while holding a moral or political conviction. Perhaps the progressive, the activists, or even the left can learn from the enfant terrible of the new order. Perhaps we need a little bit of Ali Murtopoism to defend Indonesia's democratic gains. And that's all for today. And before closing this talk, I would like to acknowledge my the institutions that have supported um, my research my research project so far. So thanks to um, Kyoto University Southern Center of Southeast Asian Studies, um, KITLV, the Royal Netherlands Center for Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies, and IIS, where I'm currently based now. Uh, again, thank you so much for having me. Um, your comments and suggestions would be very uh, uh, appreciated. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, as the uh, the chair of the host, uh, I, I'll ask the first question. 
I'll read some of the questions from people in the audience. Um, this is, uh, you're looking at a, a you're developing, uh, uh, looking at his evolution of a political approach, political theory. So the, it's not an intellectual history, but it does happen in intellectual context, not regional context. And I'm just wondering, so you have military rule in uh, uh, Thailand 57 and Burma 58, and then again in Burma 62 and South Vietnam from 63. And then, you know, again, we had the Khmer Republic from 1970. These are all happening in, uh, I, I, at this time, but some of them lead to a completely different direction, uh, particularly Burma from February 1963. Um, how much is this influencing the way that he's thinking about the military's role in, in, in you know, is, uh, to, to bring about these changes and um, the, uh, the problems of, of where, the, where it might be? Should I answer right away? Yeah, oh, cool. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, it's a great question for sure. Um, it's been a while since I look at um, you know, the military history and traje trajectories of uh, military politics in Southeast Asia. Um, but I think ideational factor um, um, is just one, one, one factor that shapes these divergent trajectories of military regimes in, in, in Southeast Asia. Um, material interests of, uh, of, of these regimes, of the military themselves and the civilian and their civilian allies also matter, I, I would say, in, in, in shaping the trajectories of these uh, military regimes. Um, timing of liberalization also matters, uh, and also its context. Um, my sense is that in the context of Indonesia, you can only do so much with uh, anti-communism, at least you know, at least um, um, uh, in the context of New Orders Indonesia, because um, after a while, um, you know, the the specter of the left was gone. So regime had to find a way to, to justify its, its, uh, its military rule. So in a nutshell, I would say um, ideas matter uh, uh, as, a, you know, as an intellectual basis, as an ideational basis to reorganize society um, 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 in accordance to you know, the interest of the military junta, but other factors, including um, the material interests of um, these regimes and their supporters, uh, and also the, you know, the, the global national context surrounding them. Um, um, I would say uh, also matters equally or, or maybe more um, um, uh, uh, and that explains this um, um, those the combination of those factors explain these divergent trajectories of um, these regimes. I don't think I can hear you. Sorry, I think you were. I think you're muted. muted. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the first question we have from the audience is for Nana Tundi. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. My question would be: To what extent was General Mortono uh, able to control the narrative and public perception of the widespread corruption and nepotism under the Suharto's regime, and why? Where did it fall short? Thank you so much for this um, question. Um, it's a great question. I haven't really looked at. The archives yet? That's um, um, that's my answer for now, uh, unfortunately. But from from the archives, from from the documents that I've read, uh, it, it it was hard uh, for him because um, you know critics and dissidents who initially supported the regime also you know complain about this increasingly widespread corruption, for example. Murtopo himself also noticed that. Um, um, uh, the CSIS folks also noticed that, including the you know um, um, corruption done by Suarto's family members, and at one point, because of their criticism of the corruption cases, they were kicked out from Suarto's inner circle. So um, it was it was also hard for for them to um, um, you know to uh, to control public perception and and to 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 defend uh, um, the regime in light of you know these um, 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 growing corruption cases. We have um, uh, two questions or a question a comment mm -hmm. from Susie Suderman. Um, is it really Ali Mortono's uh, or the Cold War thinking that in reality emerged during the New Order? And uh, then the comment the military learned from the civic mission ideas from the U.S. is counterinsurgency and laying the base for capitalist development. 
Thank you so much, Bu Susi, uh, for uh, your questions. Uh, these are really spot on. Um, I mean, in a way, you, I guess we can argue that these are just transplantations of uh, standard US Cold War thinking, for example. Um, but we can also, I guess, trace um, the influence of uh, other ideational inspirations. Um, David Borcher talks about um, the influence, for example, of Catholic integra integralist thinking, um, Mortopo's conception of labor relations, of industrial relations, of the role of peasants uh, uh, in, in society. Um, um, he said, well, the, there's is, there's is no class conflict in Indonesia because our you know our, our society is organized as a harmonious society along um, 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 the principles of Pancasila, the state foundation, uh, which you know which sounds pretty much influenced by by Catholic um, um, right wing thinking, for example. Um, and I guess this is also a challenge for me because um, as a political theory project, um, my aim here is to um, show you know things that might be original in Murtopo's or CSI's thinking and how this uh, originality can intervene um, 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 debates among Western conservatives, whether these originally, if there is any, shows that there's something that the Western conservatives have been missing when talking about statecraft or um, economic um, management or development. So that's, that's indeed uh, the challenge for me, I would say. We have a question from Ann Booth. Um, could you say more about Mortono's, uh, uh, Mortobo's uh, relations with the economic technocrats, with Jojo, uh, Sadly, et cetera? My understanding is that he often opposed their economic policies, and this was one reason for his fall from favor with Suharto, especially after uh, uh, 1980. Thank you, um, Buan. Again, uh, another great question. Um, I'm still reading on it. Um, to be honest, um, but more recently, I uh, uh, I I agree with this. Uh, well, I agree with this um, um, sort of um, 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 tensions between um, Mur Mur Ali Murtop and other economic technocrats. Um, I recently read a piece, uh, a chapter by Ari Perdana, uh, an economist who used to be affiliated with uh, CSIS, and he basically mentioned exactly about that. That, that tension. Um, his, his, his reading is that, well, the economic technocrats was still somewhat inspired by Fabian economic thinking. So they favored, um, you know, uh, deeper um, um, involvement of the state in economic affairs, whereas Ali Murtopo at some point preferred, well, maybe it's time to deregulate or, or, or it's time to um, um, let the private sector um, um, have a greater um, um, say and role uh, in the national economy. So uh, based on my limited reading so far, yes, indeed, the, uh, uh, the tensions were there and that might uh, contribute to um, you know, his house, his ouster from Suharto's inner circle. I'm gonna ask two questions in a row because I, otherwise I can't keep up. So we have a question from Dr. Phyllis Ferguson. Uh, AM's uh, espousal of uh, military and political expansion proved a poor decision. See especially Ali Alatas, the, the pebble in the shoe. Uh, can you speak to the decision regarding uh, Papua and uh, Papa and Papua and uh, Timor? And Yuji Mizuno uh, asked, thank you for your presentation, to what extent uh, this more topos conservative pro bourgeoisie capitalist ideologies alive and reproduced under the current developmentalist Indonesian state. These are great questions. Thank you, um, Dr. Ferguson. Uh, I'm sorry, but I have to say that this um, um, this is something that I haven't really looked at. So um, I'm, I'm aware of Ali Alata's assessment of more topos decision in you know in annexing. Um, Papua and East Timor, essentially. Um, but yeah, uh, I haven't really explored uh, uh, in that. I'm aware of, of the tensions, you know, among, among, among more topos in the circle as well, but that's the limit of, of my uh, understanding of, of that event, basically. And for you, Jisang, um, that's a great question. Um, I'm not really sure. I think 
the current, the more recent form of, you know, developmentalism in Indonesia draws from other, you know, other uh, other sources. So uh, Ali Murtopo's thinking might be just one among many inspirations. If you know, assuming that there's something left uh, in his thinking used in, in in the in the current conception of developmentalism in Indonesia. I'm not sure to what extent his thinking is still used in, you know, in in in, in national policies uh, and whatnot. All I can say is, you know, for at some point in history, um, his thinking uh, um, mattered a lot. Uh, why, from an attorney, why did Suharto accommodate Mortopo? Uh, did Suharto put full trust on him, or Suharto happened to need to accommodate Mortopo to control the central interests? Again, <laughs> another another great question that that you know uh, it's 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 like playing detective, right? So uh, I have a conversation with uh, about this as well with uh, with a number of friends, and even you know even we we even the kind of you know interactions or friendship or, or collaboration um, between Murtopo and and the CSIS duo, for example, Hari uh, Chansilala and Yusuf Wanandi, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, in a way it's, it's a black box, right? So we don't know whether they just simply use each other, for example, uh, or not, but um, reading on accounts of Suharto's rise uh, at the time, um, you know, as, as someone lacking um, um, popular mass base, uh, Suharto needed, um, People, advisors, uh, allies um, to support um, um, his, um, his his takeover of power from Sukarno. So, um, yeah, in a way, Suharto needed Murtopo uh, and his allies, and Murtopo, his allies, and you know the, the anti-Sukarno coalition basically also needed someone to um, um, to. Uh, to infiltrate the state, so um, Suharto was uh, was also uh, a logical choice at that time. So, in a way, they I guess I would say they use each other. Uh, leaving aside various comments on it's interesting and uh, amazing, once once has such an amazing presentation uh, to get to the questions themselves because we only have ten more minutes. Um, I'm going to go through uh, a couple of these and then you can answer them more. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering how Mortopo orchestrated the Catholic boys' students, such as uh, Casaboy, Casable from the 60s era to involve in CSIS. Um, second question, who were Mortopo's boys? How did he manage them as a team? And then third, does Mortopo's idea of floating mass, is it still relevant in discussing Indonesia's seemingly depoliticized or disinterested public to participate in politics today? Sure. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, on the questions, um, um, you know, about uh, Mortopo's connections with with the Catholic boys, or you know, who who are within his teams, uh, and how did he manage them? Um, I think I will direct our our our, uh, our audience to um, to other works who who I think did a better job in in explaining this. So um, you know, the fantastic work by David Portier. Uh, a number of uh, you know works and, and reportage on um, Ali Murtopo uh, and you know his CSIS connection done by um, um, Tempo, for example, or Made Supriyatma, for example. So those are the references that I think can better answer um, um, these uh, uh, questions. Okay, so we have the um, uh, two two further questions. Uh, one from Gregory. I can't pronounce the last name, I'm sorry. Let's say Gregory A. Uh, to what extent was Mortopo influenced by other intellectuals who were also attempting to come up with distinctive Indonesian conceptualizations of development? Emil Salim's and uh, um, Mubiarto's uh, economy, Pancasila, uh, Konjara Nigrat's vision of uh, values and development seen anthropologically and so on. And uh, one, one last question. Uh, I am curious about the OPSIS and their cultural impact managing anti-extremism in Indonesia today. These are great questions again. Um, and I will answer um, these questions collectively from uh, Dr. Accioli, from 
our colleague Anonymous attendee and from Pak Aldi Haidra Mulia, I would say that these are you know interesting lines of inquiry that I haven't really looked at. That you know some somebody interested on on these topics uh, uh, might 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 pursue these uh, questions uh, further. Um, so, to what extent uh, more topos ideas floating mass is still relevant or applicable today, um, or they're still used by some sections of the elites? Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, whether more topos opsus operations uh, have an impact or become an inspiration in managing anti-extremism in Indonesia today, that's also something I, that I don't really know, that I think some, someone should, should try to answer this. It is also a, a, a nice um, 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 question that I can also explore in my research project. And what extent Murtopoi was influenced by um, um, these other Indonesian intellectuals? I haven't really looked at that uh, yet, but again, it's a, 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 it's a great um, um, question. And, it's interesting because these intellectuals that um, um, that you mentioned, Emil Salim, um, um, for example, was also educated in the West, um, in the U.S. So um, this, you know, this this process of um, 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 interconnections and one corpus of knowledge influencing each other um, from within Indonesia or among Indonesians, but through the mediation of Western ideas uh, is 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 especially uh, in the context of authoritarian state building. Um, uh, it is also something that uh, I haven't really looked at because um, in the exercise that I just did today was really to see this, um, 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 you know, the, the strange parallels and divergences between more topos thinking and Anglo-American conservatism. So, but the way his thinking is also entangled with other networks. Uh, it is something that I uh, need to look further in, in my project, I would say. We'll, we'll take one last question for the mm -hmm. attendee, um, which I'll rework a little. So uh, in the past, there have been collaboration between Islamic organizations and military against the communists. So to what degree did Mortopo represent uh, or was, was his thinking part of an anti-Islamic movement? It's interesting because he he um, he once participated in in in, in Hezbollah, uh, a Muslim and Islamic uh, militia, um, uh, in a recent publication by an Indonesian newspaper. I I, for, I forgot exactly. Um, some speculated that uh, Murtopa was a double agent that that was implanted in Hezbollah. So uh, we we. I, you know, we don't know for sure about um, the nature of his participation in Hezbollah. However, um, he was uh, he was uh, he was part of Hezbollah. Um, um, in the accounts that I that that I've read, he seemed to be a practicing Muslim. So, in a way, um, he he was pretty close with these Islamic organizations. But uh, we can say pretty sure that. He didn't. He didn't like. He didn't like Islamist rebellions. Uh, and Indonesia experienced Islamist rebellions in the 1950s. So, um, in a way, you know, he saw the Islamists um, as uh, uh, as tactical allies sometimes, but he also saw them as uh, as a source of problems. So, hence the the nature of his ambivalent ambivalent view and relationship with Islamists. Groups. Can, can we ask, can we have one more question? Because mm -hmm. we have one from Windu Yusuf, which I think is uh, very relevant to your, mm -hmm. to continue your talk. So I got the impression from a presentation that Wartopo was the modern prince of Indonesian conservatism. Do you find any figures, any other figures occupying the same position after Wartopo in the Indonesian context? Oh, that's, um, that's a great question. Um, after Murtopo, I have to think about that. But around Murtopo's time, um, we can, I would say we can identify several modern princes uh, or, or, or several high priests of, of, you know, of, of the new order authoritarian modernization um, um, project. So Dot Yusuf obviously is, is one of them. And he left tons of writings to analyze uh, as well. 
there are also other figures such as Ali Sadikin, uh, the former governor of Jakarta, uh, who who had this technocratic vision, but he was also involved in making a vibrant cultural, making a vibrant non-communist cultural life in 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 Jakarta. So around Murtopo time, yeah, I, I I could think of several, you know, fellow princes, you know, um, I'm a fellow um, I'm, 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 I'm comrades of of, of Murtopo. So to speak, but after Murtopo, um, I haven't really uh, thought about it. So uh, thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Well, um, I, I think we'll, we'll close it there. The timing is just about perfect uh, for the end of the hour. Uh, we'd like to thank again, Dr. Ikra Anuga for, for presenting and for the numerous questions and attendance of, uh, of, of, uh, of our audience and their participation. And um, we'll, we'll call this close and thank you, uh, uh, we, we remotely we can't give a round of applause, but imagine that there is a round of applause for this. And thank you very much. Uh, and thank we'll, you so much. Well, so close. Thank you very much.